Welcome to another edition of Interruptions. I'm your host, Otis Smith. Uh, today, we have a, a special guest in the place. We have a man of God. We have a man that's a songwriter. He's an author. But most importantly, once again, this man is a man of God. He's an anointed minister. I'm talking a man that just written a book called Son of a Bishop, Mr. Eddie Long Jr. How you doing, sir? I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I'm trying to let him get a view of the book <laughs> in the background. <laughs> we'll, get, we, we'll get it. I didn't, hey, look here. I'm going to tell you the same thing I told someone. I just interviewed uh, Janet Argon. I need you to send me the book. And I need you to autograph it. It's all good. So, it's all good. so she, I'm going to tell you the same thing I told her. She said, uh, so you're not going to buy the book? I said, no, I'm not going to buy the book. I done, paid a lot, I done paid enough stuff in my lifetime. I need some free stuff now. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm going to send you my address because we, we both in the ATL. And uh, <laughs> I need you to autograph that book. <laughs> it's all good. I'm, I'm cool with doing that. We probably should just meet in person for lunch, man. Let lunch be oh, on you. Oh, we can do I... that. Oh, most definitely, let, we can do that. Let, let lunch be on you, and I give you the book for free. All right, no problem, no problem. Now, <laughs> well, hold up. Where you talking about going? First of all, now, where you talking about going? <laughs> <laughs> where you talking about it's going all, first? Man, you call it. It's all good. Okay. Well, we can go to we can go to um, uh, Chris Style or um, I haven't heard of that. Well, you know, some people call it crystals. I, I oh, call it crystals. Okay, I got it. That, that was good. That was I'm just, good. I'm just joking, man. We yeah, we we can go somewhere and most definitely meet up, have a have a meal together, man. I I would really love to uh to do that with you, man. And uh I I, I picked this backdrop uh, um for a reason because I like the saying. Hmm. I like the me, saying me. because sometimes people say that. But really, they talking about themselves. They just don't mm -hmm. want to. They just don't want to tell you. Well, listen, I have this question, and so they want to come and say, you know, some people say or they say. So that's why I picked that background. Like, who in the hell is they? <laughs> <laughs> that's I like that. Man. That's the question of the decade. How's the how's I'm, the how's the family? Yeah. And things are going up, you know. We are uh, progressing uh, individually and collectively, so we praise God for that. We got people graduating today. We got uh, babies on the way. We got marriages taking place. We got uh, employment and, and uh, entrepreneurship on the horizon and stuff. So it's all good. Yeah, I saw um, your, the pictures you put up on our Instagram uh, of your wedding. And uh, uh, so, uh, congrats on that. And, uh, you you was looking sharp, brother. You was looking sharp. <laughs> my, my first question for you today is, um, when did you realize um, that you were kind of growing up differently from friends and schoolmates based on, you know, who your parents were uh, at, uh, you know, in the thrust of everything, you know, growing up as a PK, when did you kind of figure out that maybe the way some of your friends are growing up, that your walk was going to be a little bit different, <laughs> your household? Um, great question. I, I, I get that. People ask me that often. And uh, it, it really was no pivotal point of difference. I, I never viewed myself as different. I think that um, something good about the book and, and a challenge to your viewers and your audience about reading the book, if you care to know anything about my life, if you care to know anything about, I, I would say, um, ancillary vantage mm -hmm. points of my father, because the book is about my father and I's relationship, you know, the lessons that he taught me, things I shared with him, um, you know, things that reverberate from our relationship that can help bless other households. Right. So within that, you know, I'm from my father's first marriage. So mm -hmm. a product, if you will, of divorce. And, you know, most of my friends, if not all of them, their parents were divorcees. And, you know, okay. growing up with my mom, man, we were living in, you know, a lot of low income areas. We were um, kind of bounced around from pillar to post. And my mom was giving it her all. She was giving it her best, you feel me? But growing up with a single mother, mm -hmm. that didn't really separate me from others. It actually 
caused me to be more close with others, you know, because my friends' parents were single parents, all of that. So I, I don't really view myself as having grown up differently. I really grew up more in line with okay. the, the statistics of my generation. It's just that my father began to evolve mm -hmm. around teenage years in a good way, you know, financially, right. uh, purposefully, and uh, which allowed us to be exposed to various things. So if anything, I brought my friends along with me. Okay. You know, we were coming up, my friends was always at my house. I'd be at my friend's house. Right. So in, in the evolution of coming up, my friends were getting exposed to this, to the same leveling up. And at the same time, if their financial situation for their household was not changing or their exposure, family dynamics were not changing, some of them, their parents never got remarried. My dad okay. did. Right. I still have to see a family, if you will. Right. But but me going and staying the night at their house or hanging out with them, all that kind of stuff, it still kept me connected to and tied to what I was coming from. So it, it's, it's less of a black and white thing for my life. And it's more of just, uh, it, it's more in the gray area. It's more of this and that at the same time, duality. And so there's, there's no epiphany moment. It's just, it's just life. And it's still like that for me. That's great. I'm, I'm glad you said that. And the reason being is one of my best friends, um, Keith Bogle, he, his dad was, when I was at Elizabeth Baptist Church, his dad was the assistant pastor. Mm -hmm. So we, man, we ran the streets just like he wasn't the, 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 the preacher. <laughs> <laughs> assistant I used to use him as an excuse because, you know, you figure like, hey, you, you spend night over Keith house, everything good. Like, no, nah, everything, it ain't what you think it is. <laughs> we, oh. about to get, we about to get in the wind. So I'm glad you said that because, and that's the reason why I asked that question. Sometimes people think because your father's a pastor and pastor in this big church, you, you might have grown up a, a particular certain way, right? And I even have a cousin. I've been around ministers my whole life. My, I have a cousin. My uncle uh, pastor is a retired pastor. And um, I watch, they, they love to play spades. And I watch where my parents would throw parties and mm -hmm. they would come for the card game. Still letting their light shine, not doing what everybody else is doing, but they in the midst because they know it was a mean card game being played. And they love yeah. playing spades, right? So let me, let me pause you right there. Sure, That's sure. the same way. My dad loves spades and I love spades. I learned it from him. And, uh, you know, go ahead. I, I just wanted to. No, 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 I'm, no, no. I'm glad because, see, a lot of people need to know that. A lot of people, people lock ministers and lock people in. I always say, um, I have a friend of mine that's a pastor, and I always say, hey, man, let the people see your humanity. Because when they can see your humanity, it, it becomes easier to follow you. If I just see you as pastor so-and-so, you know what I'm saying? Everybody wants to come with those same conversations all the time. Like, hey, I had this dream. Can you interpret the dream? Or I was reading the Bible the other day. Can you help me break down this scripture? Not knowing, use an example of what you said. Because if I'd have known that about your dad, I'd have been like, hey, look, uh, you know, I heard you like to play spades. What, what you want to do? You know, you get your partner, I get my partner. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to put this game down on you. You know, and so to know that, oh, uh, man, I wish I would have known that. But, hey, because you know you know how it is when somebody trump tight. Mm -hmm. You get mad. You Look, you, you done counted your books. You getting ready to say, throw, throw uh, a uh, ace of diamond out and somebody come cutting with a spade. <laughs> Like, you, get, you get mad instantly like hold on he reneging already i know you renege. you know, and you know what i call reneggers what's Just that, that. i call them reneggers. <laughs> <laughs> listen I, I know you're gonna use that now just give me my credit i'm gonna give you i'm gonna give you your credit i'm gonna give you credit <laughs> what was it like for you um you know, growing up with your brothers, what was that like? Uh, that brotherly love or that brotherly, uh, uh, you know, rivalry or what, what was that like for you, you know, having brothers um, that you could bounce things off or vice versa? Uh, you know, that's interesting because, um, you know, my dad uh, adopted my older sibling. Yeah. Um, he had a lot of surrogate, if you will, 
um, sons or what, what he would call spiritual sons. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just remember a lot of people, a guy named Monty, uh, who he and I are still very tight to this day, another guy named the Pip and uh, Al, Sean. Al Geiger? Of, yeah, Al Geiger. I know Al. <laughs> and so, um, uh, it, it's, you know, even to this day, they, they always used to pick on me, first of all. So in doing that, they used to call me Meatloaf. For me, yeah, yeah. So with that, you know, you develop tough skin. You mm -hmm. develop, you know, you get used to uh, joning, what we call it, cracking yeah. jokes. Yeah. You know, I'm a young homer, you know, I'm eight, nine years younger than them. But I had to learn how to hold my own with them. And I was like the mascot for them. You know, they were like, um, at the church, they were like the cool guys, if you will. And you remember some of yeah. this stuff. Yeah, and yeah. I was, I was like the mascot. They might send me to go holler at a girl for them or, you know, it's just so I learned game, you know. I learned um, how to speak up for myself, how to be a ventriloquist, if you will. Um, I think me getting into my own dirt, you know, a lot of the inspiration came from them and the stuff they was putting me up to. If you <laughs> I didn't learn much about the Lord from them. I learned, you know, oh my God. Some, old, some old, you know, how to cut cut the corners and all of that. But, you know, it, it, it helps in life. It helps you, you know, to relate, to walk that walk, talk that talk. So definitely appreciate it. And, and, but we were in two generations. You know, they were Generation Xers and I'm a yeah. millennial. Yeah. So, but I've always been around older people. Right. And I, I think that that's allowed me to be a little bit more averse and dynamic in conversation it does. and relatability. You know, again, the key word for me has always been exposure. My dad exposed me to a lot. These guys helped expose me to a lot. Um, there's, a, there's a chapter in my book called Who's Your Daddy? Okay. Who's Your Daddy? All right. And in that chapter, it's a real challenge as far as loyalty, if you okay. will. Right. I think we're in a time right now where you got many people who are called this person their father, mm -hmm. their spiritual father, whatever. But then if they go through a rough patch, a rough skid, whatever, then people abandon them. I, I can tell you numerous round of people who I've seen have not one, but two, three, four spiritual fathers. I'm like, this is like some type of abortion. Well, we got to check out this Roe versus Wade thing because this is a lot. How right. you got one daddy, then you got another daddy and another daddy, you know, and what I appreciate about uh, these gentlemen is that they they've always been loyal right and so their um commitment to the relationship that they had with my father right is a testament to to him who he was and how he mentored uh in my mind it, it truly it vindicates him in a lot of ways because this this is his first regime of you know mentees or spiritual sons right. or what yeah and, and they are still with them, still championing the cause, the message that was in his heart, et cetera. So through the chances of life, they show that I still view this man as a father. Yeah, loyalty. It lo lo see, what people don't understand is um, a friend of mine who I was telling you off camera, uh, Pastor Holloway, we were talking about, we, we, we did a segment where we talked about moving from uh, friendship to you know someone that you end up calling your brother mm -hmm. and and you you know that's a lifetime calling someone your brother where mm -hmm. i know you you know me i may make mistakes you know whatever that is right but you don't like you said you don't abandon me mm -hmm. and if someone says something you know my heart i could have made a mistake maybe didn't do something the right way or whatever but because we're brothers mm -hmm. we're loyalty and, and you know you don't call everybody your brother especially like for him he has a brother i have no biological brothers you know i'm, uh, the, only, I'm the only male i have three sisters and okay. i'm the only male my wife don't realize i keep telling her that, baby this is why i i don't do yard work and stuff no more because see I, I had to do all that growing up as a kid uh <laughs> no, no. Hey, hey look hey, man i'm i'm uh, i'm had always had a fear of heights my daddy didn't care nothing about that come on we getting up on the roof you know <laughs> <laughs> you know uh, and, and then had to come in and do y'all so those relationships that i developed with my boys lavaris keith 
you know, Wingo from Jagged Edge, you know, although he's like my little brother, you know, um, Andre Clayton and, and so many more, right? We we bond a brotherhood, and it was so funny is that the choir it came from the choir that we used to sing in. Like we're all connected through that choir, and didn't even realize it at the time. You know, you know for yourself when you're going through the motions of doing things, and you look back over your life now, and you see that connection that you have with those guys that you that you mentioned. And like you said, you were just as you mentioned, just a little mascot. You know, just a and now those are your, you know, your brothers. I saw um, you have it on your uh, Facebook page where you mm. was doing, you was talking to the people and you had Kyle on there. And oh. I, I thought that was so cool. You had him on the phone and I thought that was so cool because sometimes people swear they, and you know that sometimes people swear they know people and you don't know. You're just mm -hmm. going off a of perception that people put out there and, right. and, you, and, and you don't, you don't know. Um, how did you uh you might have alluded to it but how did you find your own voice um you know i just sat out on the path to be authentically me okay and you know authentically you is just that it, it's it's what you don't have to think about what you don't have to um acquiesce to mm -hmm. it's just simply what you exude right that's you now here's the thing what you ingest mm -hmm. is what you so whatever you take in is what you're going to put out as old santa says right. that we are what we eat right. and so I, I i i didn't aim to be my dad i didn't aim to be this or that or what have you what i do is i just ingest wherever i am i'm, I'm a sponge you know and so i suck up my environments and then when the squeeze comes that's what comes out of me and so you know i i i, I listen to certain people whether it's musically whether it is motivationally spoken word or what have you uh, i'm a sponge for news i'm always reading and watching the news i gotta know what's going on locally nationally and around the world um reading the word of god listening to the word of god Right. And then there, there are certain uh, ministers, primarily my father, but then there are others who I also listen to. And then just casually people who are around me, you know, the conversation that you and I've been having this morning, coupled right. with other dialogue from yesterday, all of this, I suck all that stuff up. OK. And, and so now when I speak, my voice is truly a collection of my environment now being decreed, declared, pronounced. Okay. You feel me? Yeah. And so if there's ever a moment I'm trying to help somebody who may be watching this where somebody said, well, you sound like this person, you sound like that person. You have to know in yourself if you're actually attempting to sound like someone or if it's simply that you've ingested so much of something that that's just naturally now what's coming out of you. Right. And the latter is okay. You don't want to try to be a replica of somebody. You know, no, it, no. Let's, let's be uniquely us. Okay. Let's be uniquely ourselves. But it's okay that if what is in you is skewing out of you because you absorb so much of something. Sure. So for me, uh, again, it's just important for me to be a sponge and then allowing what's in me to naturally come out. And as long as I do that and stay in that cycle, then there I am. It's my voice. Correct. That is, that is a voice as a collection of the many voices that have influenced me. And it allows you, it also allows you to be comfortable in your own skin mm -hmm. because you, for, for, I tell people this all the time, for so it took me a while to be comfortable with who I am because mm -hmm. it, it, I was always trying to, based on where I was, environment I was, I was always trying to fit in. Then I had mm -hmm. to realize one day is that it's, it's okay that I don't fit in everywhere. I'm not supposed yeah. to fit in everywhere. And I think if people will start to realize that even our youth, I tell my daughters all the time, you don't have to fit in everywhere. The only reason you're misunderstood is because you're just not around your people. When you get around mm -hmm. your people, the people that love you for you, they'll get you, they'll understand you, and they'll support you. And That's you great. can continue to be uniquely, like you said, you. God always said that, that I, I made you wonderfully. I knew mm -hmm. you before I even formed you. That's a concept that still makes me laugh to this day because it's like, wait a minute, you knew me before you even formed me, 
before you even shaped me, <laughs> you already knew me. <laughs> mind blow every time you yeah, think about it. Yeah, when you mind blow, like what? <laughs> so I've always appreciated um, you being your authentic self, uh, and I've always admired that. Um, also, I've noticed just some of the interviews uh, that you've done uh, in the past that you seem to understand that ministry, the ministry, is outside of the four walls mm -hmm. of, the, of the church. Realizing, mm -hmm. yes, we come there for a corporate expression, a corporate, not saying it's not important, but you seem to be one that realizes that uh, the, the ministry is outside of those four walls because some people you got to go get, they're not just going to come, you know, mm -hmm. and some people may not ever feel i guess comfortable right within the four walls right but mm -hmm. their heart is, is 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 pure can you talk to me uh, about uh you know you you you're having a a sense of community to be able to step outside of quote unquote you know the normal church circles and be able to be yourself and be able to minister to people that way as well i mean it goes back to my childhood you know uh from from my conception, me and my mom, mm -hmm. you know, we would attend my grandparents' church, but you know, we were just living life, you know, just regular civilians, if you will. And my father was emerging in ministry; it, it wasn't necessarily staple at the time. And so that evolution, I was just connected to what I was connected to, and praise God, I never lost that connection. Right. And we go about that voice, the dynamics of voice. Voice is also uh, viewed in however you express something. It's not not, not just the auditory expression, mm -hmm. but however you exude something. You know, your posture right now with your finger like this sitting back, that's that's your voice. It's called body language. Correct. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> it's, it's expressing, it's speaking something. And so you know, again, environments have always been talking to me and I've been speaking to them and going into church doesn't mean that I abandon other environments in which I know the language. Right. You follow me? Yes. And that, that I can speak to influence and also can speak to me. And so uh, oftentimes people get saved, man, and they feel like, okay, I can't talk to this person anymore. I can't speak to him and all that. Correct. But the truth of the matter is that we are brought out of some things to really go back into them. Correct. You, know, you talked about uh, some of your background from a business standpoint, et cetera. And there's a language that you may be able to speak that I can't speak. Mm -hmm. It just is what it is. You know, uh, every industry has a certain jargon. And here we go. When talking about developing your voice, you can tell the real from the fake as soon as someone opens their mouth. Okay. And so you can tell an imposter who's in a certain area, who's in a certain marketplace, but they're trying to act like they're of that. Right. They're using words out of context, they're asking crazy <laughs> questions, all of this. And it's like, okay, this ain't your environment. So then they have other persons who are who understand that you're like, oh, you, you know something about this. And so it's a sign that that person there, yeah, you developed a greater language, a heavenly language or whatever, mm -hmm. but still remember that street language, still remember this or that, because you can go back into those environments and speak that language. They're not gonna understand the heavenly language, Correct. but they'll understand that language that's familiar to them. And now you can talk them into something. Who better to minister to a stripper? Yeah. In a redeemed stripper. Who rather to minister to a, 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 a dope fiend yep. than someone? I, I don't attempt to do that unless the Lord truly gives me something. Hey, bro, I, I, I don't know what it's like to smoke crack. I don't know what it's like right. to shoot up. That, that's not my experience. Right. So, you know, I, I don't know how to talk you out of that. I can pray you through it. You know, I can direct you some places, but sometimes you need somebody that knows, can relate to that high. Correct. Yeah. And so um, this is why I stay in the streets. This is why I stay, you know, connected to the outlets, the clubs, the whatever that I connected to, because people receive me because they know, oh, bro, know the language. And so right. we can talk, not cap. 
they, it, it's we have authentic dialogue. Correct. Not condemnation. It's not making folks feel bad. Folks right. know what they like, and folks know the right that they are doing. It's just sometimes people just need a sounding board. Not even to hear your voice so much, but here it is. Your presence, your position is already speaking. Sometimes they just need to talk. Yep. And develop their voice. You know, can I can I really talk to God about this? Can I talk to someone of God about this? And not feel, can I just be honest? I'm tired of holding this. Can I really release this and have the understanding, the comfort? that me talking about this, I'll be okay. I'll be covered. I won't be exploited. That's what I was say. Without being condemned and, and, and being exposed, like you said. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's, and that's why, you know, it was so funny, you know, Ed, I was, I was, I named my show interruption because I was trying to be cute. I said, okay, LeBron calls this show uninterrupted. Right. <laughs> and I'm going to name my interruptions. I come in and then God started doing the thing where my show was getting interrupted because it goes where the guest takes it and mm. being able to interview people who people would think didn't know God. And then they just start talking and it's just start, it just starts coming out. And I'm sitting there like, wow, that's what mm. happened when you perceive something that you don't know, you know? Right. And, and so I always tell people interruptions get interrupted all the time. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Let it flow. What, uh, how did you maneuver through, you know, the things that were, you know, being said about your father, things that, um, you know, you, maybe people let you down, you know, in, in the thrust of all that, how did you, how did you maneuver, you know, through that? Because I always tell people, when you, when you speak on somebody, or if you, uh, trying, trying to expose, whatever, whatever your end game is, right? Whatever the end game is, right? You are affecting other people besides the person that you're trying to come at. You know what I'm saying? You, 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 mm -hmm. you, you, so for you and your family, especially for you, because this is your interview, how did you, how did you maneuver through that? How did you walk through that? It's not a past tense thing. It's an ongoing thing. It's a daily thing. It's a present thing. Okay. And you know, if, if I was going to give three points is one, don't forget what you know. Gotcha. All right. Um, what I know through prophecy, through relationship with the Lord is that we're going to get through this. So that's a stabilizer mm -hmm. that you don't panic. All right. Okay. okay. A lot of people, when they're facing some situations, they may begin to panic because you truly don't have the confidence. You get a foreclosure letter on your house, you know, if you get fired from your job, whatever, and oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. Okay, well, oh, now, now you're opening up and giving space for uh, confusion. Okay. The lack of confidence and for even the enemy to move. Mm -hmm. So don't forget what you know and okay. knowing the word. Okay. We will do this. And now, that allows you to slide into maybe what would be step two is, all right, so I'm going to get through this. What's mm -hmm. going to be the way? Well, Jesus is the way. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. That's the word. So if I follow the way mm -hmm. that Jesus, through his public persecutions. Right. Because he was persecuted, falsely yep. accused, a lot of things. You know what I'm saying? Crucified, right. lied. And so he's the way, the truth, and the light. He stood in his truth. Mm -hmm. You don't always have to say something, again, body language. Sometimes you can just stand in your speaking. He stood in his truth, and the truth sets us free. Y'all may be trying to right. lock me up, put me in bondage, whatever, but because I'm standing in truth, I'm free wherever I am. Don't gotcha. forget. Gotcha. You know, and so standing in your truth. And sometimes it's necessary to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily to say anything. Well, he's sitting up here being convicted and tried publicly. Mm -hmm. He didn't say much to Pilate. Pilate asked him a thousand questions. The only time he really spoke is when Pilate talked about the kingdom and he questioned the kingdom yeah. and spoke up about the kingdom. You feel me? So that, that's, that's another point is that understanding when to speak up. Always speak up for the kingdom. Speak up for the kingdom. He said, listen, the kingdom that I'm talking about is not your kingdom. So it creates an understanding that what I'm dealing with is above this. 
Gotcha. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not attacking y'all. Y'all attacking me, but I'm not attacking y'all. Gotcha. This is above this. I'm dealing with heavenly things. You feel me? Mm-hmm. And um, then next is just, you know, understand that some attacks that you go through, some stuff that people will say about you, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. Uh, yeah. You know, here it is. Him walking to the cross, that wasn't a sprint. That was a good long walk. <laughs> yeah, that, that. yeah, that wasn't around the corner. <laughs> once he got there, it wasn't over. You know, he had a few more days to keep running while on the cross. <laughs> you know, so uh, some kind of way the Lord just kind of innately downloaded these things to me. And, and that's just kind of what I let, you know, some conversation that come up about this, that, and the third, I don't engage in. It's not always time to speak. I just stand in the truth. If I know the truth and you don't, then guess what? That gives me leverage. Brother, uh, I got, listen, the reason I love you saying that is because I've all, my father taught me that. My dad taught me. He said, sometimes it's got to be enough for you to know you're right. Mm. So everybody else may believe that you're wrong like you said standing in that truth everybody else may say xyz but sometimes you just got to stand there and just know that you you're you're right like you said when jesus was being persecuted the world was like oh he's wrong he's this he's that he knew he was right and like you Mm -hmm. said he stood in that truth and then the second part uh that you said that i love that i I always said a little bit different is you got to know when to fight and then you got to know how to fight. Sometimes it may be time to fight, but if you ain't fighting the right way, then you still you still lo- having a losing battle. So mm-hmm. the, the fact that, like you said, sometimes you got to know when to fight, and then you also got to know how to fight. And so mm-hmm. I've always um, admired that about you, you know, uh, going through everything that you've been through, tipping your hat, because uh, also that, you know, what comes with that, you know, people people have their perceptions and have their ideas of, you know, who you are without even have met you. you. You know, and I know that, yeah, I know that makes you laugh. <laughs> You're like, you don't even know me. <laughs> and even uh, certain interview, uh, different interviews that I've watched you've done uh, and you being gracious as far as to do the interviews, just like you being gracious the interview, man. I sat back, man, the last couple of days and watched some interviews you've done, man, and I have bust out laughing. Uh, wow. Yeah, because I saw how you maneuvered. I was watching how you how you maneuvered uh, uh, some of some of those uh, interviews. I said, this brother know how to handle himself. And but the the thing I was always looking at was why y'all gonna ask that man this question? Why y'all trying to? And some of them were trying to be slick trying to you know you know kind of slide to the question you know trying to you know and and you were you were I saw one interview I ain't gonna say the person's name but you'll know you'll know what I'm who I'm talking about you set ground rules you was like hold on before we you know get it get into this here let, let me let me just let me let me just let you first of all don't interrupt me all right like when I let me fin let me get the whole whatever I got to say let me you know Get, get all that out. And the reason I was laughing, because I said, he don't know when he come on my show. That's what I do. I let my guests talk. That your answer is your answer. I don't debate your answer because I always tell people, if I want to put out what I thought, there was no need to have you on the show. I could just record myself and put it, put it out. So why would I have you on the show, ask your thoughts about something, then debate you on the thought? That doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. So I appreciate I appreciate your candor. Um, once your father had passed in transition, how did you find the time it to to you know to grieve you know um, to to kind of go through it? And the reason I ask this question is, I remember when my father died in '96, and everybody was telling me, hey, you got to be there for your mom. You got to be there for your little sister. Because my, my baby sister, we're 12 years apart. And um, I was trying to do so much of that, what people was telling me far as to be there for my mom, be there for my sister, that I became an angry man and didn't know why I was angry. And the reason mm-hmm. I was angry, because I hadn't grieved, because then I found two weeks, two weeks later, I was going to be a dad. 
So, mm. you know, I always tell my oldest daughter, I say, you know, you, you, when your mom was carrying you. I wasn't even happy about it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't even happy. So how did you, did you get time to, were you able to get time to yourself with everything going on, trying to process and grieve that, you know, Hey, I just lost my, my father. This is my dad. You know, you guys look at him one way, but this is my dad. Um, no, and it's still an ongoing process. Yeah. My dad's magnanimity is just so vast and huge. Yeah. It's not a day goes by that he's not mentioned, that he's not uh, referred to, and that can be in a positive light or in a negative light. You, you evolve to a place I'm really just celebrating when you and I were doing the pre-show yeah. and you were telling me stories about your interactions. Those type of stories are awesome because it continues to extend his life. Uh, but it adds to mourning as well, if you will, because it's 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 a new expression. Correct. Uh, I relish it and I celebrate it. And I hope that that part never, never ends. But a part of the mourning or grieving and mourning and grief are two different things. Sure. Is that there's so much drama concerning the church, even still to this day. Right. That um that was a distraction from being able to really mourn. Because now it's about who's gonna pastor. Then the pastor's announced. Then there's so much infighting concerning that. And you know. I was not utilized. I was really left on the outside. And it wasn't until that pastor resigned that then I became utilized again mm -hmm. for just a season, almost like I was being used, <laughs> if I you will. I remember. And, and so from there, once another pastor is selected, then now here's this cycle again, because, you know, I understand the truth about that relationship versus um, the untruth that's being projected, if you will. And so now you become defensive about your father's image and a legacy and being a voice respectfully, if you will, concerning what he would have been in agreement or not in agreement, right. you know? And so now that's a whole nother cycle. And it's all still concerning his life and his people trying to engraft themselves into something concerning his life that's not right, that's not proper. And it still steals, it still um, inserts itself into a space that you are looking to resolve right. and celebrate. You feel me? So mm -hmm. it's ongoing. It is. It's ongoing. You just hold it in the best space that you can, the most positive light, and uh, you move with faith and do the work that you can behind the scenes. I challenge everybody to go to counselor, you know, get into a grief management class. And this is not even concerning death. I'm really speaking to all your viewers right now. Right. You know, if you lost a job, man, the pandemic has caused a lot of pivots. You've lost people in that. Um, you know, broken relationships. You know, it could be something 10, 12 years ago somebody broke up with you, cheated on you. Yeah. You know, uh, you didn't make the team that you were trying out right. for. You know, just a lot of different things. These are all forms of trauma that lead, that can lead to grief that may be micro, but then develops into a macro. And all of a sudden you got this explosion and you can't explain it. <laughs> so I've been there, man. I've, I've. Uh, that's why I know exactly what you're talking about. Because even when my mother passed, because it was so unexpectedly that, you know, people told me to go see a counselor. And you know, mm -hmm. you know how we are sometimes. Man, I ain't crazy, you know. Just, but it was on my face. My wife was telling me, and mm -hmm. what set me free. Which, once again, I told you, God is just so awesome. Interruptions get interrupted. I, I I did an interview with Bishop Cortez Vaughn and we were talking about uh, death 
and he was talking about the scripture for, as the dear panthers so loves my soul you know panthers after you dealing with palpitations and he was talking about how when we lose someone uh, what we also lose is the thing that we used to get from them mm -hmm. and when we don't get that that very thing that you know that we used to get in from them we panic we get into anxiety and so i was fighting depression for like two years i wasn't depressed but i was close to yeah. it but i was fighting it, but, Fight it off, yeah. yeah but when he said that it lifted a weight off of me it lifted and I was able to, and that came through this podcast. And so that's why I'm glad you said what you said, because everybody doesn't have a podcast. Everybody doesn't have something that's therapeutic that could, you know, they can work through, you know, certain things, certain things that I'm able to work through it is, this, is, is, is that God told me once, um, he said, you haven't lived a tragic life. You just been inconvenienced your whole life. He said, everybody loses people. But what you're doing is you're taking the loss and you're magnifying the loss and not magnifying me. So now the mm -hmm. loss, the problem is becoming bigger. You're making the problem bigger than me. And mm -hmm. I'm, the, I'm the solution. That's and good. he started to speak to me and say, have you ever been raped? And I was like, no, I ain't, no, I ain't been raped. Have you ever been this? Have you ever been that? You know, God just started going through that. He said, so you just been inconvenienced. And it allowed me to start putting my life in perspective, right? Mm -hmm. And stop thinking that what I went through was, I'm the only one that, you know, ever went through it and making it bigger than what it, you know, what it really is. And so that's why I'm glad you spoke about, um, you know, people getting help if you need to, you know, sit down and talk to someone. Because like I said, when my father died, I became a very angry person because I hadn't dealt with how I was feeling Right. And I did feel like I got pushed aside because I'm just like you. I'm named after my father, right? Yeah. I'm the third. Yeah. And, oh. and, and you know, I, I'm the only male. And I felt like, man, everybody's been there for my mom. Everybody's been there for my dad. I mean, for my sister. Ain't nobody, you know, ain't nobody like, y'all do know he had a son, right? <laughs> So I know, I know that feeling, man. And that's why I've always admired you from afar and took my hat off to you. Um, because, and, I, and I'm sure you know this, a lot of people don't realize, man, it's hard being strong all the time. Like, yeah. <laughs> even if you even work it out. You got to put the weight down. You got to put the weight down sometimes. Thank, thank you. You can't be lifting all the time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Tell me uh, about, I only have just a couple of more questions. Uh, tell me about something that your father taught you, right? You didn't get it at that time, but you understand it, got it now. And it's like, you wish you could have that conversation and say, Papa, that thing you was trying, I got it now. I got it. <laughs> hmm. The concept of now, Pop preached about now faith a lot, and it's just about going now. And so... You know, I look back over a couple of years and said, okay, I get it. And, and, and moving in now, then things possibly would be a lot different. Gotcha. The now, it's just the power of now, that NOW. He sat in that for a season, publicly and privately. And, and, and now it's not even about whatever you're moving is going to be fully accomplished now, but you're a step closer to it because you move now. You know, if you build that house now, it ain't gonna be finished today, but you laid three or four bricks, you put the framing up, you did something that now your next now is expedited because of your your ladder now. So that now thing, man, it, it, it's heavy, man, that's, now. That's good. The last two questions I have for you, and they're, they're one for you and the other is, uh, uh, is uh, your mother, which is the first one, your mother. What is the most misconception that people have of your mother that they don't know? Well, I guess the biggest misconception is just that, uh, understanding who my mother is. So I always have to bring clarity because, like I said, I'm from my father's first marriage. So right, right. They, they, I don't know how much they know or don't know about me. So they may be considering my bonus mother or my biological birth mother. Mm-hmm. 
know, both who are living and, you know, um, enjoying life and all of that. So that's it. That's, 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 the, that's the answer to your question. I told, you, about? I, told, uh, I told you, I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't debate the, the answer. I just, I just asked the question. My last one is a similar question, which is what is the most misconception about Ed Long Jr.? Hmm. It depends on what crowd you're in. <laughs> it depends on, depend on who we're talking to. Um, so what I'll say to resolve that, because it depends on who we're talking to, right. is um, one, I'm from Atlanta. I'm from the Omarosa Atlanta, the real Atlanta. <laughs> All right? And I'm also from the not Atlanta. So I grew up in all Atlantas, you feel me? I know. Um, I'm born and raised here, so I know what you're talking about. <laughs> you feel me? Also, I'm very forthright. I'm going to speak to the elephant in the room. I'm not an antagonist. I'm really a protagonist. Gotcha. In this day and age, people are uncomfortable. There you go. Your, your, your show. With interruptions yeah. that lead to resolutions. Mm -hmm. We're in a world now where people don't want you to say anything to them. They don't want you to call anything out. They just want you to be whatever. And I mean, allow them to be whatever and just be okay with it. And that's fine in your own world. But when things are being done that affect others, I live in a space. Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. Yeah. There are wars taking place right now. Sometimes most often, all the time, mm -hmm. in order to get to a place of peace, when you have two groups or more that are warring, mm -hmm. there has to be a tension, meaning bringing them together right. to work through the problem. And so if it's tense like this, you know it's going to be more tension the closer that these two um, groups that have, have different viewpoints, ideologies, et cetera, come together the tension intensifies right but if we know that we're coming together for peace mm -hmm. then we know that we'll get through this and that tension will subside okay. if we can have honest and true repentive and forgiving dialogue right and so that's my trajectory is to be the protagonist by understanding that we have to have some agitation in order to become pro pro meaning for right in a positive direction and so i want people to understand that about me if i ever approach you if i'm speaking to you if i'm hollering at you about something it's never to tear you down it's not to diminish you it's not to do any of those type of things if i call out a truth right. or if i share with you with you my truth right that's for understanding that's for vantage points that's for uh you know uh, empathy if you mm -hmm. will and all of that so that we can bring a resolve to it, so that we can become pro. Pro you, pro me, pro us, pro God, pro the kingdom, and move forward, man. Man, I appreciate you, man. Uh, you, you, when I look at you, man, I see, I see a young David, man, who, wow. who, who walked out against Goliath. Because remember when Goliath was out there, but David, you would have thought David was Goliath. David walked out with with boldness, like man, who is this dude talking about the Lord? Dude, what 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 you you want? I want all the smoke. Remember, David wanted all the smoke, mm -hmm. and I mean, and I mean it when I say young David is that you you're not like you said uh, uh, afraid to call things out that need to be called out. You're, you're not afraid to uh, you know stand like you said stand on your truth and fight the right way, and like you said, and that sometimes. Like you said, people get uh, they misconstrue that as something else when it's just you know fighting for the truth and standing on you know what's right, and that's what David did, and that's why I said you were you remind me from me watching from afar, you re, you remind me that even when I saw your father's home going online, man, and just how you stood there with, with your faith and, and 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 boldness, and and one of the things that really struck me, man, that I was like, wow, was Mr. Primetime Deion Sanders himself? Mm -hmm. 
his mm-hmm. words that day. I, I I always challenge people go back and look at it. I ain't I ain't gonna I ain't gonna give it to him. They got to go look his words that day. I was I was sitting back and I was just like I was just like thumbs thumbs up. And even though I shared it with you before I get off, I want to share it with everyone else. When Ed was talking about the story I had of um, his father, uh, Bishop Eddie Long, was uh, I used to visit the church a lot of times and, and, and he knew of me and he uh, Bishop T.D. Jakes was at the church. And I, this was right. This was when your father was about to go from pastor Eddie Long to Bishop Eddie Long because I, I couldn't I would they, they kept having a little saying they kept saying Bishop number 12 Bishop number 12 and I didn't know what they were talking about at the time and so I I walk in your father's uh, office uh, the pastor I was with uh, at the time walked me in and uh, also uh, Uncle Ben uh, Pastor Ben Gaither and uh, do you do you know uh, Pastor Curry gave me my yeah. first strong exalted concordance for my birthday so, yeah. oh yeah, brother, I had some good times at Newburgh. <laughs> hey, hey, free, free. <laughs> so, and I and listen. Anytime I move, I moved Ed. My wife would take. That's the first thing I'm looking for. Hold on, for we hold on. Wait a minute. Where, where my strongs at? Where my strongs? Because I we can't. I can't lose. Yeah, we ain't gonna lose that. And I walk in, and everyone that will see this, I walk in. And, and uh, Bishop Long looks at me, hey, Otis, how you doing? I'm like, I'm good. And he walks me over to Bishop Jakes and said, this is Otis Smith. This is a young man you're going to hear a lot from in the future. And he didn't have to do that. And I always re- thanked him for that. And he always used to joke with me. I didn't tell you this part, but he always used to joke with me uh, when I would see him at church. And I would walk in and he said, you know, he said, you want to, you want to, uh, you want to come up here and preach? And I used to, I used to tell him, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. That's good. <laughs> don't, I, don't, don't do Because at that point, I wasn't ready. I was intimidated. I was like, don't, 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 don't do that. Don't do Because, <laughs> you know, the oh. church, the, it was a, the, yeah, I wasn't ready yet. Now, if, if he'd have said that today, I'd be like, oh, yeah, you, you know, I can do it tomorrow. You know, <laughs> so I appreciate you coming on the show, man, blessing us with your presence, giving us time, man. Uh, we don't take it lightly. Um, tell everyone right quick where they can find uh, find the book. Listen, I appreciate you as well, Otis. Hey, you can run over to my website, www.edlongjr.com. Click on the merchandise link and you'll be routed to Amazon to purchase the book. Or you can just run over to Amazon.com. The book is called, you see it right here behind me, Son Son of of, a Bishop. Son of a Bishop. Go and grab yourself a copy, Son of a Bishop. And make sure we stay connected on Instagram. Oh, most definitely. Ed Long Jr., Ed Long J-N-R, the same on Twitter, Facebook, the whole nine. Listen, I love y'all with the love of Christ as always. Don't stop. Keep Don't going. Stop. I'll hit you up, man. We'll set up a, a luncheon or something, man, and uh, break some bread. There it is. Sounds great to me. Thank All you right. again, sir. All right, man. Peace. All right.